Hello, and welcome to episode 91, part 1 of Awesome Astronomy for January 2020. A new year and a new decade, except it isn't, because there isn't a year zero, and therefore just like when you count the 10, it belongs at the end of the group of 10 you just counted. This is the hill I will die on, and the decade starts next year. Frankly, you all look pretty stupid celebrating this imaginary decade <laughs> end with your endless comparison pictures of what you looked like 10 years ago and your braggart lists of achievements. Frankly, you're all going to look pretty silly in a year's time when you realise your gross mistake and have to do it all again next December. Idiots. But until then, we have a year full of astronomy and space goodness to enjoy. Will we finally see commercial space fulfil its mission? Will Project Artemis continue its breakneck pace and keep 2024 on track? Will Betelgeuse explode and become the only astronomy event of the year? <laughs> Will we all be disappointed yet again by the Mars opposition? Will NASA make a series of over trumpeted announcements that turn out to be mundane and about things we already knew about? Yes. Will ESA's Rosalind Franklin finally lift off for Mars? Will Elon Musk and his dark army of incel twatterati finally end the night sky for all and bring about the end of days? <laughs> we have no idea. But the sky will always surprise. Institutional culture changes like an oil tanker, and multi billionaires are always bellends. So, stay tuned. It'll be another wild ride, and we will be here, reporting it all a month late, surrounded by our <laughs> usual inane bots, packaged in an already ageing format, and delivered with mild enthusiasm into a saturated market for your hourly pleasure. Happy 2020, people. <laughs> and of course, joining me for this cavalcade of nonsense and occasional swear words are my co-hosts, the perpetually enervated Ralph. Happy New Year. And the forever indignant Jenny. Hello! That's not indignant. No. <laughs> did I do Enervated right, though? Oh, you did do Enervated right. <laughs> when, I, when I finally said it right. <laughs> How the devil are you, people? Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Oh, happy New Year. Yeah. We're, we're a bit late this month, aren't we? We are. Yeah, we couldn't get our acts together, but... Um, that's Christmas for you. That's right. There's been a lot going on. I mean, we've had a new decade, some say. <laughs> yeah, some say. Uh, they'd be wrong, but some say. And it's been a busy time. It's been a busy time. We all did just that Christmas week. It just flies by and there were too much drinking and pies and turkey. And What did you all get? I got an Xbox. Ooh. Ooh, get Which you. I think is actually probably a pretty bad idea in the last year of my PhD, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what you need is more distractions. Yeah, exactly. It's like procrastination city, here I come. <laughs> nice, nice. But yeah, it came with and that, that... Minecraft, Sea of Thieves, and uh, an expansion to Fortnite, which is what I think all the cool kids play. I don't know what Fortnite is. I know what Minecraft is. I now know is. how you feel when you don't get our cultural references, Jen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know Minecraft. That that's that's my limit because I've got kids. But Minecraft's cool. If you just want to numb your brain for like an hour. I checked out at Doom and Civilization. Oh, <laughs> Civilization was a good game. Oh, that that will destroy a marriage. <laughs> oh, that that and a uh, transport tycoon. I still love transport tycoon. <laughs> I Happy played days. Roller Coaster Tycoon. It's similar. It's very similar. Very oh, similar, okay. not as good, but similar. Yeah, yeah. Rokas Tycoon was banging. Yeah. Did you ever? You, I used to do the thing <laughs> where I'd build a roller coaster and then I'd uh, I'd set the speed really high so that the people would go flying off the end. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Was that just me? Maybe it was just me. It's just the kind of person you are, Jenny. Yeah, says a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> Ralph, what'd you get? You know what? I can't remember. Oh, <gasps> you ungrateful little sh. <laughs> 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 Christmas oh. is just so long ago I can't remember what I got <laughs> Did you get socks? Of course I got socks, yeah Yeah, well there you are then <laughs> Do you know what? I didn't get a single frigging pair of socks this year and I I've didn't get any socks I've this year I've reached that either. age where that's actually slightly disappointing Well don't you worry Paul Because every Christmas, just as I give John The European Southern Observatory calendar That they send us I shall now be giving you all the socks that my mum gets me So as, <laughs> so as long as my mum survives you will, be, you will not be short of socks Gloves or scarves Oh, God bless Mrs. Wilkins. Yeah. 
<laughs> oh yeah, no, I, 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 you know, I've reached that age where it's just I, I get a couple of books. That's it, really. A couple yeah. of books I to read. I got any books for Christmas this year. Yeah, I so. got, I got John Le Carrier's new one. I got a couple of other books, and I think I got a T-shirt. Oh, and I got an inflatable sheep. Oh, we saw that. That was good. Yeah. 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 yeah my, my, and a taser. I got a taser lighter. That was cool. And they were both from the same yeah. person, both of my daughter. My daughter your, who... Your kids get you the best presents. In, in yeah. her naive going out doing a little bit of shopping, bought me an inflatable sheep <laughs> off, off, a stag, off a stag do rack. She didn't you know what it was. say she, naive. She just thought it was funny. Um... I thought it was freaking hilarious. Oh, it's been such a good story when she turns 18. Oh, I cannot wait for the moment when she realises. I would love to have seen the look <laughs> on her mum's face when she said, that's what dad would want. Yeah, yeah. Oh, she, she, the two of us were in mm. tears mm. on Christmas morning. It was very, very funny. And that, that's what she wanted. She thought it would make me laugh. Oh, yes, it made me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Not for the reasons that she's thinking of. Not though. for the reason she was thinking. And I cannot wait for the yeah. day when that little, it just dawns on her. They're just like, oh my God, when I was 10, I. Yeah. It's yeah. Fun. It's that, a good that story, was my, though. That was my Christmas made. But I think Dartmoor Skies are the people that got mm. the best Christmas present this year, aren't Didn't they? Didn't they just? Just before Christmas, too. Yeah. They certainly did. So we've got to extend our congratulations to Dartmoor Skies, who we mentioned, I think it was just last episode, wasn't it? It was, mm. um, yeah, November or December, yeah. Yeah. Um, they were looking, they were raising money for uh, to upgrade their telescope. Um, they had issues, and... The, the, the wanted other observing equipment for the Dartmoor National Park, and in total they raised three thousand two hundred pounds. Woo! Um, so if you donated to this amazing cause, I know many of the listeners did. Yes. Thank you so much. You you are awesome, and this is an awesome cause. And they've got a new scope. They went through their sort of what do you call it? It's an extension target or whatever it's. Um, yeah. So they reached their target, and then they had a, like an extension, and they got that as well. So yeah. they did really really well. So they've, they've had a happy, happy Christmas. Except for the one asshole on Twitter, when they announced it, he then went, oh, the Dartmoor basically should be for local people. All these people will come and visit and they'll spoil it all. Like, oh, I think oh. that was a troll. I, that oh, can't I, be oh, genuine. Yeah, of course I it is. I was like, what a... What a t- we shouldn't have yeah. people in Dartmoor. That can't be genuine. Oh, I bet No, they, that's definitely someone just poking... But if anybody's going anywhere near Dartmoor now, or lives anywhere d- near Ooh. Dartmoor, you've got this wonderful new scope that you can look through in some of the most yeah. pristine skies in the British Isles. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's going to be cracking. It's a beautiful mm. part of the country anyway, so do go and support them. That'd be fantastic. Right then, have we got any emails? Oh, we have, yes. Um, so, um, first of all, uh, our good friend Stephen Morris in the UK uh, got in touch with us to say, Hi guys, just wanted to say thanks for another great year of awesome astronomy. Very nice. Mm. Uh, every episode was a gem, but the undoubted highlight was the September episode, which contained that epic opening rant that left me weeping with laughter, the northern Chaz and Dave and make dire straits look avant-garde <laughs> comments that were perfectly summed up my feelings about the pair of brothers and the continuous stream of sex we at the end of the new segment. <laughs> uh, Please keep up the good work. It really is needed in these darkest of times. Oh. Steve, I remember that was you, wasn't it, Paul? I remember that one. It, that one was very good. It might well have been me. I, what, that, what one was that? I'm just trying to remember. I think that was the one about the um, Elon Musk fanboys. Oh, that was it. That was it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was a particularly yeah. good rant. Yeah, yeah. I have my moments. And then we also had an email from our good friend Dave in Australia who particularly enjoyed Jen's interview with Dr. Phil Segan and um, there's a question for you at the end of this one uh, Jen Uh, but Dave Uh, says thank you for your deep dive on the 97A supernova observations with Dr. Phil a subject on which I had only a vague notion of before this show I learned so much about the supernova processors and it made me ponder on the origin of the elements that is the stuff of life did I detect a slight moistness in Jen's voice during this interview? I don't know, but in my mind's eye, Phil is quite handsome. Or was it just the cosmic dust getting Jen excited? Perhaps it's all just me getting excited by exploding stars. P.S. Never lose the swearing or the sexual innuendo from the show. It is greatly appreciated all throughout the Anglosphere of this earth. Uh, it's actually not. We we do get yeah, emails to the contrary. so much yeah. abuse about the swearing and everything. <laughs> Yeah, well, they can all get fucked. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we bleep it out, so if you don't like it, 
I mean, if, if people can't take bleeped out swearing in this day and age, they they really can't enjoy oh, living I in know. this world. Uh, and, and the thing is, it's not like we're pitching this show to kids, is it? No, maybe we should just put an E, the, the, the E for explicit thing that's on iTunes, and then we've got every base covered, haven't we? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah and, and Ralph's got really good at the um, f***ing, f***ing, bleeping, f***ing, f***ing, bleeper. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see how that works in the edit <laughs> <laughs> so Jen how dishy is Dr Dishy Phil Segan oh he's extremely handsome <laughs> do you know what um, I think what it probably was was I don't know it's just because I, I'm really good friends with Phil and it was really nice to be able to just sort of sit and chat some science with a friend in an interview because mm-hmm. I've never really had the chance to do it before um, yeah. yeah I bet so yeah I'm hoping that that's what was coming across. Phil's great. I love Phil. Although cool. I think he's disappearing soon, which is sad. Oh, no. Flying back to America land for a uh, permanent government position. Wow. So it's still a Sean me base, but, uh, but yeah, in February. So that's sad. Oh, Sad. Yeah. <laughs> Aww. And I, I just want to finish off mm. by mentioning, a, well, giving a couple of Twitter shout outs um, just because it's the new year and we want to start off in the right fashion. So it'll be a little bit of some self aggrandizement. Of course. At Marcel Janker says uh, the Space and Astronomy podcast that makes me laugh out the loudest, awesome Astropod. And at Seamaster GMT1 says, hello all, thank you for another great year of awesome astronomy. Thanks for reading my email and answering my questions about how many jelly beans it takes to fill the moon. To Jen, my favorite part of the outtakes. Tits. Happy New Year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they were good outtakes this year. Oh, they were good outtakes. If you haven't listened to them, go and listen to them. They're yeah. at the end of the Christmas episode. Yeah, I, I enjoyed listening to those even again, uh, even though we'd been through them. I, I oh, yeah, them. I sat there. Yeah. I was a bit piddled. I was like, I'm going to listen to the size of Santa and outtakes and sort of skip nah. forward to those bits. It was good. Uh, of course, oh, I do wonder... Great just how much of it is navel gazing do do other people enjoy it as much as we do not being in the outtakes this is true uh, this is true i do wonder this but i i enjoy them so yeah hey i mean if, if we uh, we're only self-indulgent once a year <laughs> just the once <laughs> <laughs> just the once but for 20 minutes <laughs> Okay, you guys, New Year, and I mean it this time. Keep it short and snappy. I'm looking at you, Millard. Yeah, I'm not keeping it short and snappy. Actually, I've only got I've only got two stories. I, you're interrupting me now. <laughs> like, <laughs> jeez, start as you mean. I'm looking at you, Millard. Listen, <laughs> hit us up with the news, and I'm watching the clock, Jen. What better way to kick off a new year than with something old? And by old, I mean old. Like really old, even older than the wrinkly Martians themselves. Steady, believe it oh, or not. Shit. <laughs> uh, to be honest, um, what I'm talking about is actually pretty much as old as you can get. Um, it's the first direct image of the most distant, unlensed star forming galaxy known to humankind. Mm-hmm. That's where you, hopefully you all go, ooh. ooh. Oh, sorry. Ooh. <laughs> It's known as uh, Mambo 9, and it was imaged using ALMA, so the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, uh, the one that's out in Chile. And when we see this galaxy, we're looking at it as it was 970 million years after the Big Bang. That's it. Less than a billion years, and we've got a fully formed star-forming galaxy. The galaxy contains phenomenal amounts of gas um, and of course my favorite dust (laughs) and in fact this galaxy is so dusty that the amount of dust by mass is about one third of the amount of stars now for a typical galaxy in the local universe you'd expect about one hundredth of the amount of dust compared to the amount of stars so it is super dusty and the existence of this amount of dust is actually really intriguing um, in and of itself because it implies that the galaxy has been forming stars for some time to allow that dust to build up, Mm -hmm. despite it only being 970 million years old. Now, how that amount of dust can exist in such a short space of time um, was actually really interesting. And 
they don't really know the answer at the minute, but answering that question will help us figure out how the first galaxies form and subsequently shape the universe. It's thought that this galaxy is forming stars at a rate of hundreds of solar masses per year, which when you compare that to the Milky Way's proxy one or two solar masses per year, it's absolutely racing away. Um, the galaxy was not discovered this year or anything. Um, it's been known about for about a decade, but we needed to wait for a powerful long wavelength telescope like ALMA to become available before we could get a picture of it. And of course, just like any distant galaxy picture, it's not of any beautiful structure. Um, to be honest, it kind of looks like a blob, uh, but that blob of light can tell you all sorts of things. And um, the galaxy is so dusty and so far away that you do need this long wavelength telescope like ALMA to be able to detect the light that's emitted from the dust because that dust has absorbed all the optical light and it's also obscuring any optical light from the stars. Uh, the galaxy's mass is mostly gas, um, which means that it is far from done in terms of forming stars. In fact, there is 10 times more gas and dust in that galaxy than all the stars in the Milky Way. Whoa. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's... Yeah. 10 I'll say that times again. more I'm... gas and dust than all the stars in our galaxy. I'm just going to say that again. Wow. Yeah, it's a truly remarkable galaxy and it is absolutely fascinating how different that galaxy is compared to galaxies in the local universe so watch that space mm. really marvelous so next up i am sticking with galaxies but i'm moving decidedly closer to home with the results of a study on da -da -da, magnetic fields Ooh. Now, mm, now, normally magnetic fields are pretty much a swear word in astronomy. Uh, if you mention them, people will look at you like you've asked them to eat your dog's freshly squeezed out turd. Um, they're hard <laughs> to measure. Yeah, <laughs> they're hard to measure. They're hard to model and no one really understands how they form on galactic scales. And what about magnetic fields? Uh, uh, wah, wah, no. Wah, wah. Uh. <laughs> Now, things have taken a step in the right direction with some observations made using the Karl Jansky VLA, uh, or the Very Large Array, um, of galaxy uh, NGC 4631 in Canis Venetici. Um, it's otherwise known as the Whale Galaxy. Um, that's because it kind of looks like a whale as viewed from the side. Um, just so that you can kind of have that image in your mind's eye for the next bit. Now, astronomers have managed to measure the galactic magnetic field of this galaxy and have discovered that it has a spiral shape. So picture that whale of a galaxy sitting inside a very thick coil with its head and tail poking out. And that's pretty much the gist of it, where that coil is the magnetic field sort of wrapping itself around the galaxy. Hmm. Now, the good news is that one of the theories on how galactic scale magnetic fields might form explains this shape. And it seems that a dynamo model can produce this spiraling magnetic field. Now, in that model, slowly rotating galaxies build up huge magnetic fields over billions of years by converting kinetic energy into magnetic energy. And this can happen because some of the gas in galaxies is electrically conductive, so it's a plasma. Um, and there's also turbulence in the gas caused by things like supernova explosions. And the magnetic field ends up being an extension of the spiral arms of the galaxy. And this discovery is exciting because it helps us start to hone in on understanding exactly how galactic magnetic fields occur. And it also raises more questions, just like any good science should. And... The team who made this measurement are hoping to carry out more research, try and figure out how common these sorts of magnetic fields are and if they all have this spiral shape. So finally, a very quick mention of Comet Borisov, which is the second known interstellar interloper to visit our solar system. Now in November and December, Hubble observed the comet and uh, in the November image, the comet is seen in conjunction with a distant background galaxy. Uh, so it's pretty neat. Mm. And I recommend you checking that out if you get the chance to. Um, you can clearly see the coma and the nucleus of the comet in these new Hubble images. And in a few months time, we're sure to have some interesting science come out from them. Uh, the comet is now on its way out of the solar system, but it's probably still bright enough to be observed from the southern hemisphere in January. Uh, that is if you've got a pretty massive telescope. 
Um, it's magnitude 16 mm. uh, going on to magnitude 17. So, yeah, I, I, you need a, a massive big yeah. fat telescope. But if you've got one, you may as well try and have a look for it. Um, it's in the constellation of Centaurus. Um, but to be honest, just have a Google and find its exact location. And that's me done. Really? Yes. <laughs> wow. This 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 is a new year. It's a new decade, Paul. So some would say, but they are idiots. Um, <laughs> Ralph. Okay, so my first news story is quite incredible, really. It's evidence for a dramatic event in the life of the Milky Way, and I mean dramatic. And not that long ago, relatively speaking, in a study that was published in Nature Astronomy, researchers from the Institute of Astrophysics of Andalusia in Grenada used the European Southern Observatory's Very Large Telescope in Chile to take a look at the central part of the Milky Way so that they could get unprecedented resolution to investigate the history of star birth in our galaxy. What they found was about 80% of the stars in the Milky Way central region formed in the earliest years of the galaxy, between 8 and 13.5 billion years ago, which is nothing strange. But then it revealed that this initial period of star formation was followed by about 6 billion years of inactivity. Then there were... Oh. Well, it then gets even more weird because they were really surprised to find that about just 1 billion years ago from now this quiet period came roaring to an end by a quick and intense burst of star formation when stars as massive as a few tens of million suns combined formed in a quick burst. Now, this is this is like the activity in a violent starburst galaxy on a massive scale. Now, during a starburst, many massive stars are created, and since they have shorter lifespans than lower mass stars, they reach mm. the end of their lives much faster, dying in violent supernova explosions, which prompts the researchers to say that this burst of activity which must have resulted in the explosion of more than a hundred thousand supernovae was probably one of the most energetic events in the whole history of the milky way that's insane that is insane yeah and that that leads you to think does that mean then that this was brought on because another galaxy kind of passed by us like we see when we look at other starburst mm -hmm. galaxies it's normally uh, galactic interactions or do yes. we think then that this is just something in the evolution of certain galaxies yeah, yeah and yeah. maybe it's just common that there are starburst periods in the evolution of spiral galaxies we just don't know it's interesting it's fascinating it's mm. absolutely fascinating uh, yeah, so my second story, I want to come to something that's a little bit closer to home, well, uh, a lot closer to home, and certainly close to a lot of amateur astronomers' hearts at the moment, because since the middle of December, it's been all over Twitter, that the doomed red supergiant star, Betelgeuse, is dimming. And it's Ooh. really dimming. <laughs> which, it really uh, is. very uh, noticeable. I mean, you can actually really tell <laughs> if, you're, yeah. if you're a watcher of the constellation Orion you can see just how much it's dimmed oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. and it's causing many to speculate that this could presage that the eventual fate of Betelgeuse a supernova may well be imminent um, now we know that a star running out of fuel will dramatically dim for about a month before it goes kablooey that's certainly if it's a star that's big enough which of course Betelgeuse is and the mm. first indication we'll get will be neutrino detectors on Earth that will twitch between 15 minutes and 3 hours before we see it in the visible light. Um, the supernova should be as bright as a full moon, gradually dimming over a period of around a month. Um, then we'll be left with a dim burning ember of Betelgeuse to spy with large telescopes. In a few hundred years, a supernova remnant will have blossomed out, but whether it will have expanded enough to enjoy in our lifetime is unknown. Um, the course, thing about it being as bright as a full moon, though, is that all of that light is going to be concentrated into a tiny pinprick. Mm. Yes, it is. So, it, yeah, that is just absolutely insane. You can't really imagine it. No, no, no. But is it going to happen? Well, n probably not. But no. <laughs> the, the, the really disappointing thing is that uh, if it does go pop um, in our lifetimes, we're going to lose the left shoulder of Orion. Um, and the reason yep. that, that, I mean, you think about it now, you've seen a lot of people on Twitter and in uh, articles in um, uh, astronomy magazines where people are actually getting sad that, that Betelgeuse has got so dim that they can't make out, well, well, they can't actually see it as Orion as they recognise it because it's now gone from the seventh brightest star in the sky to not even in the top 20. It's really yeah, dimmed wow. that much. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, it, um, it, it's been incredible. I, the, the, the clearest nights we've had over Christmas, um, and I popped out and looked. It's like it, when people started to say, "Oh, it's, it's really dimming," and I was like, "Yeah, but is it really dimming? Are you gonna?" And then I walked out, and just like bloody hell, yeah, yeah, that'd be exactly the same. Yeah, you can really see it. Yeah. Um, and, and the light curve does show that uh, while it's a variable star that ranges from magnitude 0 to plus 1.3, it has now reached its faintest level in more than a century with magnitudes as low as um, plus 1.2. So mm. this could be the first signs of a core collapse, or it could also be dust moving in front of the star, blocking some of the light. Um, yep. But researchers at Villanova University in the US and the American Association of Variable Star Observers um, these are the people that actually calculate and publish light curves. These tell us that um, Betelgeuse has two separate dimming and brightening cycles. It's got one cycle that lasts around 425 days, and the other lasts around six years. Now, they conclude that the current faintness of Betelgeuse appears to arise from the coincidence of the star being near the minimum light of the uh, six-year light cycle, as well as near the deeper-than-usual minimum of the 425-day period. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and they continue. They they plan to continue to monitor the star. If the star continues like this, um, the minimum should occur very soon. That's if it hasn't already. So, do we think it's going to go pop? Well, I mean, Occam's no. razor suggests it probably isn't going yeah. to. It's more likely that that there is some other something else that's causing this, and we do have a, a good candidate there from the people at Villanova and the AAVSO. Um, but you never know. It might do. Um, yeah. Just keep an eye on Orion. The, the, nah, I don't think it will. I don't think it will, but you know what? The sky, as I said in the introduction, the sky always surprises us. Yeah. It always throws us a curveball. Um, it could be, yeah. but maybe the dim will get even dimmer than we could ever imagine. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. And the thing is, we don't really know what's going to happen just before a star goes no. supernova because we've never had the opportunity <laughs> to observe it happen. Certainly so not there this are models close. and we no. can guess. Not this close yeah, exactly. and, and so, not in the era of telescopes, yeah. no. No, exactly. So there are models, and we can do some guesswork, but mm. no, no one really knows. Yeah. No, we we we've seen more supernovas in distant galaxies than than we have in our own. Yeah. Yeah. So it's good. And be- um, someone um tweeted us. Who was it that tweeted us asking about why can't we just use our telescopes to figure out where it is in its um fusion cycle? Oh yes. Uh, who is that? That was at Sane Alex underscore mm-hmm. um, because you know on the main sequence stars are fusing hydrogen into helium and then when they run out of hydrogen then they start fusing helium um, into things like carbon and oxygen and mm-hmm. then massive stars like Betelgeuse they go even further than that and they all fuse oxygen and and so on and so on all the way up to iron and that's the point where they go supernova so he was asking well why can't we just figure out like mm. what's there as in is there oxygen is there silicon and then we know how far along it is we know how long these fusion stages last because uh, the last one fusing silicon into iron only lasts for a day and it's a perfectly reasonable question yeah it is and um it's a very good question and the reason is because all of that is happening in the core of the star and um, the light that we see is when we look at a star, we only see the light from the photosphere. So that's the very outer edge of the of the star. But with Betelgeuse, it's even harder because we we struggle to see the photosphere because um, it's been puffing off layers of material um, for you know thousands and thousands of years because it, it pulsates, it sort of expands and contracts, expands and contracts, um, and so. Uh, basically we just can't see the light that we need to be able to see it's hidden away in the middle of the star we can only see what's going on at the edge and at the edge um all you've got is is hydrogen and helium the stuff that made made up the outer edge of the star you'll have some material dragged up by these massive convection cells that these stars have and like when i say massive like betelgeuse will have convective cells that each cell takes up sort of a few percent of the surface of the star they're they're absolutely ginormous and and so yeah a combination of blown off material blocking the photosphere and the photosphere not having the information that we need to figure out where it is in its cycle 
So, so that's why we can't tell. And that just means that we've just got to keep an eye on it and um, yep. wait for those neutro- neutrino detectors, but also keep observing it because, um, as Paul says, it's we've not had one since the age of telescopes in our own galaxy. So mm. yep. we're going to get a really close view of this if it does go pop, but it's probably not. No, it's probably yeah. not. And yeah. it certainly won't be dangerous if it does. So uh, the, don't, the really nobody sound, worry about that. The really sad thing is we're probably not going to see a supernova in any kind of proximity mm. um, in our lifetime and probably several lifetimes after that because there probably very isn't... Rare. They're, yeah, they're very rare. And there isn't really a candidate in the, no. the kind of nearby visible part of our galaxy that is, is kind of due to really, really go. Yeah. Yeah. Right then, it's time for the Sky Guide. And we have a new format. What we, do we do. What do we do? What, what, what do we think, people? I like it. I love it. Tinkering yeah. it around, and um, I think it works. Yeah. What we're going to do, just, just to kind of get you up to date, each uh, month we're going to pick a constellation, probably a constellation that's that's reaching um, its sort of high point, its best best observing point, um, kind of in the, the that kind of golden window that kind of 10 o'clock to midnight zone i thought uh, mm. of when most yeah. people are probably observing um through the year so each month a, a, a constellation in that kind of zone um and we're going to look at the history of it we're going to look at where it is its description key features and the deep sky a couple of good deep sky objects are in it that you can observe an image and some tips about those and then we'll have a little solar system roundup and that's it cool so this month, January, uh, we're going to look at the unicorn. We're going to look at Monoceros. Mm. So, um, it's a constellation that isn't all that old. Um, it's actually one of the fainter groupings in the winter sky. Um, you think of the winter sky, it's sort of quite famous for big, bright, bold constellations. Um, actually, this is one that isn't, and most people probably couldn't point out its shape very easily. Mm. Um, and this is Monoceros or the unicorn. You won't find it in Ptolemy's um, Almagest, which is the sort of you know the original famous forty-eight constellations. Um, it only seems to have been first plotted on a star map in sixteen twelve by Dutch cartographer Petrus Plant. Now we're going to get told off. <laughs> now is it Plantius or Planicus? Not sure. Anyway. I'm going to say nothing because I just don't know. No, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, twelve years later, German astronomer Jakob Bartsch. Um, listed it as Unicornu, um, and the name that you say is the Greek name for unicorn, though no one seems to know why. It probably just makes it sound older than it actually is. Um, oh, well, I have something that maybe explains it. Oh, go on. No, you've got to wait till I get to my Oh, bit. right, perfect. I'm going to keep you on your tender Oh, cool, right. Ah. Mm. Um, there is evidence that it is based on an older constellation, possibly of a horse, um, and there's a suggestion that just before our Dutch cartographer plotted it, a similar constellation was observed on an ancient Persian star map that was discovered by a French historian called um, Joseph uh, Scaliger. But that's our little background to this this constellation. Jenny is going to give you your location and your description. Yeah, and I love that we're starting off with a constellation name that I can actually pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> the rhinoceros. Yeah. So rhinoceros uh, is a northern hemisphere constellation, so sorry for any of our... Uh, Southern here, Southern Hemisphere constellations. Um, well, at the minute, it's Northern Hemisphere anyway. It lies on the celestial equator, uh, which is just the kind of projection of the Earth's equator onto the celestial sphere. It's uh, reasonably small, actually. It's bounded by some pretty famous ones, Canis Major, Canis Minor, Gemini, Hydra, Orion, all your favourites. Um, and like Paul said, it's not an ancient Greek constellation and as such, it doesn't really have any myth that goes along with it. But why a unicorn? Um, because, yeah, it seems very 21st century hip because everything's mm. unicorns at the minute. <laughs> and, uh, well, one thought is that uh, unicorns are actually mentioned several times in the Old Testament. And Petrus was not only a cartographer, but also a clergyman. Uh, yeah. So I feel like that story is not unreasonable, hmm. and I can kind of get behind calling it Monoceros because 
it does sort of look like a horse with a horn. Yeah. Uh, but I think it looks like something better. Uh, I've got a better description, basically, than than a horse. And I, I think this will help people find it. Hmm. So, yeah, Monoceros is a little bit tricky because it doesn't contain any bright stars. Um, most of the key stars are about magnitude four. But you can easily find it because it's located directly to the left of Orion, sort of left as you're looking at it on the sky. Um and its borders are bounded by three of the brightest stars in the winter sky. So Betelgeuse and Orion, haha, I'm saying brightest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Typically the brightest stars in the sky. Betelgeuse um, in Orion, Procyon in Canis Minor, and Sirius in Canis Major. And uh, to me, anyway, the constellation almost looks like a drunken man on the sky. So he's had a few too many bevies down the local. He's on his hands and feet, looking for his keys, <laughs> his head up by Orion's shoulder, right? Staring straight at Orion's belt. Um, and I suppose the man's head is traditionally the unicorn's horn. Uh, and he's got his palms flat on the floor as he's fumbling about. <laughs> so the brightest <laughs> star... See, Ralph is, uh, Paul even is laughing because y- you know exactly what I'm saying, right? Yep. It's a pretty good description. Yeah, it's so, a great description. Yeah, I think it's good. So, uh, the brightest star in the constellation is Beta Monocerot... Right, Monocerotis? Yeah. Monocerotis, I would oh. say. But Monocerotis? Yeah. I could be wrong. Uh, either. I think either's good. Yeah. The brightest star in the constellation is Beta Monocerotis. I've gone for that way. We're going that way. Located at the wrist of the drunk man who's fumbling about for his keys. <laughs> now, this is a magnitude 3.7 star, and you can find it by drawing a line through Orion's belt and then following it across the sky for about a distance, which is three times that of the length of Orion's belt. Um, a star just before Beta is Gamma, and this is like the drunk man's fingertips. So then follow a line to about 10 o'clock, that sort of uh, angle for a similar distance that you just went um, along the sky to get to beta. So going up, you'll find delta. And then if you draw a line between delta and Betelgeuse, one third and two thirds of the way along this line are two more stars which make up the neck and the head of the drunk man or, you know, the unicorn. (laughs) Um, If you go in the opposite direction, a similar distance to that second star that marks the head will take you to Zeta, which is the butt of the man or the unicorn. And then draw a line downwards, sort of in the direction of about five o'clock, parallel to the line between Delta and Beta, and you'll get to Alpha. And then equidistance between Alpha and Beta, you can find M50, which is an open cluster. And that is the constellation of Minoceros. Beautiful. And Ralph's going to now take us through a couple of DSOs. Yeah, so being just past the festive season, I'm going to start with a nice visual treat in the form of NGC 2264, otherwise known as the Christmas Tree Cluster. Uh, This isn't an easy one for those of you who got their first scope for Christmas, but it's perfect for this time of year, and it'll give you an indication of how far you've come observationally when you bag it. Of course... If you recently got a large telescope um, or a seasoned amateur astronomer, the Christmas tree cluster will be easy enough to observe in between Monoceros and Gemini from 8pm onwards. Now, to find it, draw a line from the magnitude 4 star Epsilon Monocerotis in the head of the unicorn to magnitude 3 Alzea at the foot of the southernmost Gemini twin. Halfway along that line sits our target, which should look like a tight cluster of stars in a small scope. There are actually more than 40 stars in this cluster, but around 20 are visible even in binoculars. The brightest star of the cluster, 15 Monocerotis, is a variable double star, and it'll let you get your bearings as this is the base of the tree, which may look upside down this time of year. If you image the cluster, you'll soak up some of the Christmas tree shape of atomic hydrogen and darker dusty regions that pretty much wow in professional images and which make up the wider cone nebula and the fox fur nebula all a part of the same ngc 2264 complex next up we can head back towards epsilon monocerotis in the head of the unicorn to find ngc 2237 or the rosette nebula take a look about a degree from Epsilon Monocerotis in the direction of Canis Major or the bright winter triangle star Procyon. Alternatively, it's exactly halfway along a line drawn between Beta Monocerotis in the unicorn's front foot and Alhina in Pollux's left foot in Gemini. 
If you're in a dark sky site, you'll pick this cluster and maybe even some of its nebulosity up in binoculars. And binoculars are really useful if you do have a dark site because this cluster's a whopping one and a half degrees across. That's about cool. three times the width of the full moon. Oh, it's pretty though. Oh, yes. We're very pretty. In light polluted skies, you're only likely to see the cluster in the middle. But a small scope, especially with an O3 filter, should bring out the surrounding petal shaped molecular cloud around the cluster. If you can image the nebula with a CCD, CMOS or DSLR camera, you'll reveal far more in guided long exposures. If you have a hydrogen alpha filter, just a few 10-minute exposures will have you feeling like a pro and revealing the true beauty of this bizarrely neglected wonder in Monoceros. For both these deep sky objects, avoid the first half of the month when the moon will be spoiling the view. Unless, of course, you're imaging with hydrogen alpha filters, because then the moon won't matter. Mm. I, Indeed. It, it's a difficult one. I've I've seen the Rosette Nebula once visually, uh, really, really faint. Hmm. Really difficult to see, and I, I was trying to look for it recently. I couldn't find it. Yeah, you can get the cluster, but it mm. does, you need the conditions to be right or have yeah. filters to 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 get any of that um, yeah. nebulosity visually. Yeah, it's one of those sort of perfect sky objects, but it's a great mm. object when you see it. Really amazing. Yeah. Great imaging target as well. Mm. Oh, it's, it really is. I mean, I, I remember because of the size of it and how well it comes out, especially in um, hydrogen alpha, um, I remember um, just doing a speculative one on that. And that was years after I first started getting into astrophotography. And I was thinking, my God, why is it taking me so long to do this? It's just astounding the images you can get mm, mm, mm. with very short exposures as well. Mm. Okay, so back to the solar system for a quick skirt around the highlights close to home, and we begin with the planet. Um, we're still pretty barren on the planet front at the moment. The best views are our two closest neighbours each side of the sun, Venus just after sunset and Mars just before sunrise. Venus is sitting in Capricornus and should be easily visible at magnitude minus three in the low southwest sky sometime after 4pm, depending on your sky clarity and your own eyesight. You will have, uh, you'll have some time until between 6 and 7 depending on your latitude um, to grab a view of Earth's evil twin which starts January um, at 81% illuminated and ends at about 73% It is super bright mm. at the minute It is super super bright at the moment I mean it's actually brighter than minus 3 but that's um, kind of because it, it's down in the, the lower part of the, the atmosphere um, yeah. near the horizon it's, its magnitude isn't as great as it would be if it was up at zenith so mm. Um, it's about minus but, three, but I think it's actually more like minus four and a bit or something. I, it, it's sort of crazy bright. It's but, phenomenal, yeah. yeah it, it, it is strikingly bright at the minute. Yeah, well, yeah, if, yeah. well if you think that um, um, Venus is um, minus two, sorry, it, Jupiter is minus two, mm. you know, this is mm. this is a magnitude brighter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. completely. Um, and it's really obvious it is as well. It is very, yeah. very bright. Mars, on the other hand, uh, 93% illuminated at the moment and is sitting at the bottom of a firecus and rises about 5am, um, which isn't much time before the sun starts to sort of put in an appearance. Um, its apparent diameter is pretty small at the moment. Uh, magnitude um, at around 2. Its low altitude will not allow anything in the way of interesting detail, um, as well as its small size. And with the exception, of perhaps, of the polar cap, you might pick that out still. That's usually visible. Mars is still at the, it's still very much at the start of a very, very long apparition, as Mars apparitions are, um, with opposition not until October this year. So mm, the views will, time. yeah, slow improvement through the year mm. um, to get better Mars. Jen, this year we're going to have four lunar eclipses. Ooh, four! Uh -huh. Four. I know. And the first one is happening this month. We're getting a penumbral eclipse of the moon. So. Not a particularly exciting one, but you know, you can still see it. And it's going to happen on the 10th of January between 5pm and 9pm Universal Time. It's a penumbral eclipse, so the effect is subtle. But you should still be able to notice it. You'll just notice the moon looking a little bit dimmer than, than normal. So the eclipse is actually visible from a lot of different places. Uh, the continents of Africa, Europe, Asia, and pretty much all of Oceania. Um, but for Australia, the moon's going to be really low on the horizon and um, it's not going to be visible on the East Coast. And uh, sorry, New Zealand, it's not visible to you guys at all. When the eclipse occurs, um, the moon's going to be a few days away from perigee, which is its closest approach to Earth, which means it's going to look pretty big. 
So that's a nice little touch. Yeah. Very nice. Ralph? Um, I'm going to start by saying there were only 11 listeners last month in New Zealand, so f*** them. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, 11 listeners. Don't listen to Ralph. <laughs> He's just a stubborn old git. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to talk about meteor showers um, now. Uh, typically, we've got the best meteor shower in January, peaking on the 4th, which I think is today, if I've got this show edited quick enough. Bad news, because the 66% lit moon will be casting its glow in the sky until after it sets around 1am on the 5th of January. Damn. However, if you can wait until this time, or brave meteor hunting in a moonlit sky before this hour, the Quadrantids is not only the best meteor shower of January, but rivals the summer Perseids with an expected rate of almost two bright meteors per minute. And being winter, Whoa. the skies actually get dark to provide some contrast for a meteor shower, mm. unlike the Perseids. Follow the handle of the plough from Magrez uh, through Alioth to Mizar. Ignore Alcade at the end of the handle and follow the line from Mizar the same distance again to find the radiant in Buertes. But really, looking anywhere in the north all night should give you a treat watching debris thought to be from asteroid 2003 EH1 burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. The Quadrantids should put on a good show for a night or two either side of the peak on the 4th of January. And it's a Saturday. And it's a Saturday, so you can stay up as late as you want. Yeah. Cool. Unlike my next one. So finally from me, we have the Gamma Ursae Minorids meteor shower peaking on the 18th of January. Don't bother looking any nights before or after this shower as it only provides us with three average brightness meteors per hour under ideal conditions during the night of its peak. Even the originating comet's too embarrassed to admit it to own in this shower as we still don't know the solar system culprit. The meteors <laughs> radiate from just below the bowl of the little plough or the little dipper for American friends, but don't waste your time. Look at something more interesting and reliable or just go to bed instead. <laughs> <laughs> Right, this month, uh, the moon is first quarter on the 3rd, full on the 10th, last quarter on the 17th, and new on the 24th. I wish you clear skies and happy hunting. Okay, so this is the point where we'd normally have some sort of um, debate or discussion and we're going to start something new but next month and what we're going to do over the coming months is take you through exploring the electromagnetic spectrum um, and so we're going to start in February with an introduction to the electromagnetic spectrum. What is it? Uh, what are we talking about? What are the, the component parts of, of the EM spectrum? And then month by month we're going to look at the different components one by one and um, really give you a good layman's kind of description and guide to what these things are and how they're used in astronomy um, and in science and um, how you can better understand them. So that's going to kick off next month for us. So now we have a question. Um, it's from our good friend um, on Twitter, a, a at GKT underscore Wales. Um, whoop whoop Wales. Whoop whoop Wales. Um, um, who I believe she works for for BBC Wales. I believe. Oh really? Um, oh. Yes, yes. Um, better um, get this right then. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and she says, "I love looking at the mountains on the moon. The Apennines are just beautiful. Correct, they are. They are stunning." Yeah. But if there's no plate tectonics, how did they form, particularly as a range like that? Good question. It is a good question Excellent. because they look very much like mountains on Earth. They look like they would be formed by exactly the same processes mm. as we see on Earth. Um, well, yeah, and it's worth it's worth mentioning that on Earth, basically mountains are, are, are formed in two ways, mainly, which is uh, the sort of plate tectonics, you're, you're folding an increasing of, of, of the Earth's crust so you look at somewhere like the Himalayas where um, the, the India plate has crashed into the Asian plate and created this sort of great uplift of sort of folding and creasing of, of, of the crust and of course the other form um, is is volcanic so you look at places like the, the Scottish Highlands for instance which are quite small mountains mm -hmm. in earth terms these days but they were vast they were bigger than the Alps originally and they were all volcanic and they're, they're now the sort of remnants of a, a volcanic mountain range so something different and Hawaii and Hawaii of yeah Hawaii. Hawaii yeah exactly um, 
So, um, oh, fascinating fact I found out about mountains last uh, two years ago, which I still keep dining out on, which I think is awesome. <laughs> um, you know the, the the southern downs of England. So if, if you know England, there's a, a series of hills and downs sort of south of London, all those mm-hmm. little sort of folds and downs. Do you know why they're there? Uh, was it as a physical barrier to stop uh, the French getting into it was. London? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. No, they're actually <laughs> stress creases from the formation of the Alps. Get away. Huh. Get the f*** in, look at that. I know, I, it's astounding. It's like one of those one of those things where I was, it was actually as I was travelling through the Alps and I was, I was reading something on how they were formed and things like that. And you know when you do one of those rabbit hole jumps in, on the internet, you start following links and things like that. <laughs> I, I discovered that the, the southern hills, the hills along the sort of southern, just within the southern coast of, of England were formed as a stress crease, or still are in fact, from a stress crease from the formation of the Alps. Wow. Significantly wow. less fun to ski on. Yes, mm. yes. But that's not how mountains on the moon form. No, but that's exactly. Earth. That's just Earth. That's Earth. So mm. the moon, give us the moon. Yeah, the moon doesn't have any plate tectonics, so pretty much all of the mountain ranges on the moon were formed by massive asteroids impacting the moon during the early days um, of its existence. Mm. Um, like truly enormous asteroids, you know, making colossal craters, um, not like the ones you get today, but back when the moon was forming, the earth was forming, the solar system was a lot more murky. It was filled with a lot more debris that since, you know, either landed on objects like the moon or has been whipped out of our solar system or settled into things like the asteroid belt and and stuff like that. Um, But yeah, essentially you get a massive asteroid, it slams into... Um, the surface of the moon it makes a crater it liquidizes the rock and the rock kind of comes up at the edges of the crater as a sort of shock wave percolates outwards and that's how the mountain ranges form yeah it's basically crater rims they are and although it seems quite surprising given that they look very much like um, uh, earth mountain ranges particularly if you're looking at the Apennines, uh, which is a really good example, you can actually see how it, it forms the actual curve of the giant impact basin that it's around. Uh, so it's, it's mm. although it's a surprise visually, it does actually make sense. It does follow that curve around the, um, around the mm. impact basin. Yeah, when you look at them, you can see that all the, almost all the mountain ranges, the famous mountain ranges of the moon, are all curves. They're all crescents and things like that. So you can see how they're, they're, they're kind of... The crumbly edges of massive craters, basically, and then there's a few others. You get things like, in a similar way, you get the uplift mountains in the centre of these big craters as well. Yeah. Um, and they're they're as large or larger than some of the the, the sort of Scottish mountains, and um, some are you know getting to the the sort of smaller mountains of the Alps and things like that. They, they're quite large, and that's from the um, the surface springing back. So imagine the the initial impact of, a, of an asteroid. The ground sort of gets pushed pushed down very hard by the shock wave, and then of course it springs back, but and, and it, it springs back higher than it is kind of the bottom of the crater settles. So you end up this. Kind but also, of, the impact can literally liquidise the rock. Yeah, exactly. Heat. So it sort of lifts back up into this sort of cone shape in the centre. I mean, you've ever watched you know a drop of water going into into a, a yeah a slow, slow motion. motion. You, you get that blob that bounces back in the middle, and it's exactly the same thing. And it's it's, it's just with r- liquid rock, and of course it then hardens and becomes this sort of uplift mountains in the centre so they're all formed by sort of asteroid impacts um there is some volcanic action on the moon or was um there are volcanoes and these but they're actually in in form of sort of these domes um so and they're they're actually much harder to see they don't then they're not like those kind of how you visualize a volcano on earth typically as that kind of mountain with a with a hole in the top essentially um they're much more they're sort of low flat domes um, with a little sort of pit in the middle, um, and then you you kind of got to know where to look for those. Mm. Uh, you you can actually get them uh, where in the central peaks um, are made of multiple peaks, and it's even more pronounced on Mercury, which form uh, in the mm. same manner through asteroid impacts. And I think some of those central peaks, particularly when it's really smooth around the the rest of the the impact basin or the impact crater, um, they're absolutely fascinating and cast beautiful shadows over that smooth um, mm-hmm. smooth almost plain bowl like plain uh, when you look at it through uh, through telescopes oh yeah mm. yeah the crater tycho the one right at the bottom of the moon that's got a really nice yeah. um uplift mountain mm. Mm. in the middle of it that's one that um 
you can easily spy. Yeah, absolutely. Through a, a decent sized telescope. Yeah, and Petavius is a really good one as well because that's got a mixture of both having a whole range of peaks in the middle from the way that the the lava solidified as it was kind of um, bouncing back up. But it's also got uh, a few craters that are in there as well. And you've got this kind of like scorched bit of uh, a streak that's in there that come, that presumably is from an asteroid that hits at a grazing angle as well. So there's a whole range of features in Petavius Crater that's well worth looking at through a telescope. So there you have it. Yeah, fantastic. Right then. Well, that's it. The barman of time is ringing the bell of the inevitable last order. And we're all wondering if we can fit in a cheeky whiskey chaser with that last pint that we'll have to neck too quickly before we fall outside to puke our kebab all over the pavement of possibilities before stumbling into the taxi of fate. A metaphor for our age? Or just my convoluted way of declaring an end to this charade? Please give us some reviews, particularly on I Spotify. I don't think we've got a lot on Spotify, really. And it's been ages since we've had anything on iTunes. Go on. Give us give us a thumbs up and say, I like this show. Go listen to it, bitches. And we only know what you like or don't like in the show if you tell us. So email us at the show at awesomeastronomy.com or tweet us at awesomeastropod with your thoughts to read out on the show, suggestions or questions. Get involved. So, until our space exploration show in the middle of the month... It's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com. If you want us to read your comments out on the show, send us your views, opinions, questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening and from Cydonia Base, end of transmission.